libretto, this and writes this libretto, this opera called uh, Margaret Garner. And uh, I happen to uh, have been uh, at the premiere of the libretto, uh, the homecoming premiere. It was first premiered in Detroit in 2005. And a few months later, uh, it was premiered in Ohio, in uh, Cleveland. And it was, it, was a, it was an amazing event. Morrison was there. Uh, her sister was there, other family members, her sons were there, um, you know, members of her, uh, friends of hers from literary circles, publishers. It was a, it was a big event. Um, there was also some controversy, which I could talk about later on, but I don't want to get bogged down into it. Uh, we were, uh, our group was able to go and visit the farm uh, or the plantation farm where, where Margaret Garner sort of uh, uh, was found when she in Kentucky. Uh, that sweet home plantation that is called in the book and uh there was some controversy of, uh, about us being <laughs> being there um but i could talk about a little bit about that if if you would like later on okay so i want to keep it moving so some of the primary themes in beloved that we see are slavery and american dehumanization uh motherhood uh, african-american dehumanization <laughs> motherhood men and masculinity uh the past memory and trauma um, notions of home, what does home mean? Um, is America a home for African Americans and others who are marginalized? Um, what does home mean for Setha? Uh, is she at home when she finally escapes slavery? Or, or is uh, home something that she can never find? And also, of course, notions of freedom. What does it mean to be free for these characters? What does it mean to be free for us as the reader? Um, Morrison is, uh, uh, is, an extremely, um, is an extremely insightful writer, and uh, she allows the reader to really sort of become immersed in her narratives. Uh, and of course, her, her, her writing has been described as being very lyrical and very poetic. And I think that is the case, but she says in interviews that she doesn't want uh, people to read her work and just think that it's poetic and lyrical. She wants us to be confronted with the hard sort of hitting facts about history and, and, um, and American and African American history in particular. But anyway, the writing is gorgeous, right? And I think that has a lot to do with not only, you know, her powers as a writer, but also the influence of uh, both black and white writers, including people like uh, Sterling Brown, the poet Sterling Brown, uh, the poet County Cullen, as well as Faulkner, Virginia Woolf, and some of these other very important modernist writers that she read at the time. Um, so these are some of the themes uh, in Beloved. Um, so the this next part of my presentation, what I want to do is sort of uh, divide things up a little bit. Uh, and as you realize, I hope you realize that the novel is a tripartite novel. It's divided into the three sections. And each section begins with a, uh, with a quotation about the house, you know, Bluestone 124 Bluestone Road. So I want to talk about each section of the of the book uh, and uh, each of these sort of opening sections talking about the house. So the first quotation that we see on the opening pages is, um, it says, 124 was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. The woman, the women in the house knew it and so did the children. For years, each put up with the spite in his own way. But by 1873, Setha and her daughter, Denver, were its only victims. And one of the things that Morrison, as a modernist or postmodernist or experimental and uh, innovative writer, however you want to deem her, I don't think she would call herself any of those things. I think she would just call herself a writer. But me as a reader and a critic and a teacher, I'm going to call her a modernist, innovative, postmodernist writer. What, she see, what you see in her work, particularly in this middle period of her work, when she, when she wrote Beloved, and then she wrote Jazz, and then she wrote uh, the novel Paradise, is a great deal of experimentation, uh, narrative experimentation. What she, she has said in inter interviews during that, during that very fruitful period, middle period of her career, she wanted to stretch the limits of the novel. What can you do in the novel to stretch uh, to stretch it in terms of its narrative and in terms of form. And so we see this in Beloved because when you open up Beloved, you are dropped down in the middle of something. <laughs> 
You don't know what's going on. You don't know who the characters are. You don't, who is this baby? What's the spite? What is she talking about? Where are we even located? So there's a lot of disorientation at the beginning of this novel. And you find this in a lot of her other novels. I tell students when, when we read Morrison, and I usually teach at least one of Morrison's novels every semester in, in my classes, in each of, each of my classes. I tell, I tell I warn students that you're, you're not gonna know what's happening. And this is on purpose. <laughs> Morrison, uh, as a as a innovative postmodern modernist writer, what she wants to do, she's similar to Faulkner and Virginia Woolf, she doesn't want to spoon feed the reader. She wants the reader to figure things out for him or herself. Now, the thing about Morrison's uh, text, her, her her narrative, is that you know when you start off, you are disoriented, but as you read more and more, the puzzles begin to begin to uh, fit together. Right, uh, and then you know she the, the the narrator might mention a character. You don't know who this character is and how this character is related to the other characters, but by the end, by the time you read through the books, by the end of the book, things should make a whole lot more sense. And it's no, it's no, uh, it, it sh should come as no surprise that Morrison is one of her favorite genres of literature, uh, mysteries. She loves mysteries. She loved mysteries, I should say, and so. Um, and so you see that reflected in her narratives because, again, at the uh, particularly at the beginning of her novels, almost all of her novels, she does not she does not uh, sort of uh, give you uh, you know specifically what's happening in the books, uh, and it it, it, it it takes a while before you get to know exactly what's happening, uh, but eventually it comes. But the other thing that that does is that by Morrison giving up you know some of this sort of authorial um, power that she allows the reader to make up his or her own mind about what's what's going on in the novel and 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 what's important to the reader in the novel so uh morrison's books lends themselves to a lot of discussion <laughs> because especially if uh, a book like beloved for example do we know if beloved is a real person is beloved a ghost neither what is beloved how does this, you know, is she, is she Seth's child that come back from the dead, only 18 years old now? And, you know, and, 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 and so all these kind of supernatural things that, that happened that, that might be real and might not be real. And I think she, again, she takes a lot of this, uh, 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 this, so these narrative strategies from the 19th century writers like Hawthorne uh, and Poe and, and Melville. Uh, she absolutely adored these 19th century American writers and she liked the way they structured their narratives. And of course, Twain brings in that realist aspect of her novels. But at any rate, so at the beginning of this, that 124 was spiteful. So we are, she already sets up the novel that we know something bad is happening <laughs> in this novel. When she talks about, you know, that, the, her, that she and the daughter, Seth and the daughter were the only victims. The victims of what, right? We don't know. Right? We don't know until maybe three or four pages into the novel when Paul D happens to come by. Now that's another interesting thing about this novel. Paul D just happens to show up when Setha is thinking about Sweet Home, right? It's almost like she conjures him up because if you think about it, what a coincidence for him to be, for, for him to actually you know, show up when she's thinking about Sweet Home. So what Morrison is doing, again, like a lot of postmodern writers do, is they're leaving it up to the reader to decide, is this a coincidence or is this something else going on here? Um, I'm not sure what, what's happening because on the one hand, you could say, yeah, it, you know, it's a coincidence, but it could happen that he just happened to show up at that time. It's not out of the realm of possibilities. Or you could say something, maybe some something more supernatural is going on in the novel in which Setha is talking about or thinking about Sweet Home and then Paul D shows up. Just and and you notice how in the novel they just they just begin a conversation like they had not seen, like they like there's been no time between the last time that they saw each other 18 or 20 years earlier, right? They just step back into old times into their conversations and that happens a lot you know i think in in some of our friends friendships that we have in the real world um but it's just really really interesting and and to me a little bit strange that there would be not a whole lot of like 
where'd you come from? And, you know, in the excitement, it's just like, it's, it's like this, uh, you know, everyday thing. Like he shows up every day at the, at the uh, certain time and they start talking. So it's a really interesting way that she opens the novel uh, with, with this sort of, um, with this sort of menace that we don't know, uh, that we don't know anything about, but also, you know, bringing in this, uh, this character, uh, Paul D., who will be uh, particularly important in Setha in her recovery from uh, the 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 horror and the terrible things that happened to her throughout uh, in the, throughout the rest of the novel. Okay, so um, the second half of the novel talks about the house again. One twenty four was loud. Stan Page could hear it even from the road. He walked towards the house, holding his head up as high as possible so that nobody looking could call him a sneak, although his worried mind made him feel like one. Now, this second half of the novel is where, uh, by this time, Beloved has returned, apparently from some other world, <laughs> maybe, or maybe she's a, a woman who has had some kind of trauma and she's lost and she happens to show up at 124 Bluestone Road. We don't know. Um, but in this section of the novel, um, Setha and Denver believe that Beloved is the uh, is the is the dead baby that comes back to life. Now I want to get I want to talk a little bit about um, um, Margaret Garner for those of you who don't know about it. Maybe you don't know the background of the Margaret Garner story. So I think it's a good time to sort of fill in a little bit. I don't know everything about what went on with Margaret Garner. There have been a, a number of books out about her, uh, and I think uh, another one is coming out or has just come out about Margaret Garner. So Setha, the character in uh, Beloved, is based on uh, the true story of Margaret Garner, a fugitive slave in the late uh, 19th century. Um, so Margaret Garner uh, uh, was a, a house slave, and she belonged to this family called the Gaines, the Gaines family in Kentucky. Uh, and, she, and she lived on this plantation called Maplewood Plantation in Kentucky, in northern Kentucky. And in 1849, uh, she married Robert uh, Garner. So the Garner name, Morrison takes the Garner name of the real life slave, Robert Garner, and gives that name to the slave owners in Beloved. So um, Seth, uh, not Seth, I'm gonna keep calling her Seth, but <laughs> Margaret Garner uh, marries Robert. So um, then uh, the Gaines slaves, the whole lot of them, including Margaret, Margaret Garner and Robert and, their, and, the, and the children that they had, uh, were sold um, to another one of the Gaines brothers, Archibald. And apparently, um, so Robert and, and uh, Margaret had one son, and then uh, Archibald had sexual relations with Margaret, and uh, three more children were born. So she has three children by Archibald Gaines and one children by, uh, by Robert. At this time, Margaret is around 23 years old. And so what happens after that is that um, she and Robert and the uh, four children escape from the plantation in Kentucky and they make it to free territory in Ohio. So they make it to free territory in Ohio, but because of the Fugitive Slave Act in, in 18, of 1850, uh, there's a law that says that runaway slaves can be brought into slave back into slavery by their masters, even if they make it to free uh, to the free territory. And this is exactly what happened to Margaret Garner, Robert, and the children. They are taken back uh, into custody, or at least uh, uh, Archibald Gaines tries to take them back into custody. So when they're in o in o Ohio and they're hiding out in an abolitionist house. Uh, the slave catchers and the and the marshals come to to get Setha and Robert and the children and to bring them back to Archibald. Um, uh, Setha uh, realizes what is what not Setha but uh, but Margaret realizes what is what is going to happen that she's going to be taken back into slavery. But before uh, that happens, she manages to murder one of her children, uh, the young the the baby, and uh, uh, cuts her throat uh, with a butcher knife and she tries to kill the other three children. Uh, she is thwarted by the sheriff and some of the other, uh, and some of the other uh, blacks that were surrounding her. Uh, and so 
that she wasn't able to carry out her plans because she did not want her children to be brought into slavery. She was gonna kill them and then kill herself because she did not want to be brought back into slavery. And, and part of what Morrison does in the novel is she shows the desperation, you know, how desperate you must be uh, to make the decision to kill your own child, to kill your own children, rather than be taken back into, into slavery. And so, you know, uh, to think about how, how horrific slavery must have been in order for someone to make that kind of decision. One of the questions that Morrison raises, or I guess two of the questions that Morrison raises in the novel is this notion of freedom. As a mother, does Setha or does Margaret, did Margaret have the right to do this to her children? Did she have the right to murder her children rather than see them taken back into slavery? And the other question Morrison wants us to think about in the novel is, was it right for her to do it? And those are two separate questions. Did she have the right to do it? And was she right to do it? And of course, Morrison doesn't give us the answer. She wants us to think about these questions ourselves, put ourselves in Margaret Garner's place and to think about what we would have done in her place. Right. So these are some of the many questions that Morrison is getting us to think about. And one of the things I love about Morrison is that as a as sort of an innovative modernist writer who doesn't give you all the answers is that she puts us in these very difficult ethical and moral positions of the characters. And she wants us to work through these moral and difficult moral and ethical positions ourselves as readers. Right. That's what she wants us to do. What would you have done? if you were in this character's place. And she does that all throughout all of her novels. So anyway, getting back to Margaret Garner, um, Margaret Garner was taken and uh, she, she and the children were put in jail, right? They kept the children with her and also Robert. They were put in jail for two weeks and then she was, um, she was placed back into the custody of Archibald. Then the sheriff, you know, they were gonna, you know, then put her on trial, but Archibald actually started moving Margaret and the children and Robert from different safe houses because he would lose his property, right? If the sheriff got them and they put her in jail or they executed her, he would lose his property, right? And he didn't want to do that. So he managed to elude the authorities and eventually he was able to, he, he sold Margaret, Robert and the children to a plantation in Arkansas and then um, that plantation owner sold uh, Margaret, Robert, and the, and the children to a plantation in, in uh, Louisiana. And then after that, um, uh, uh, Margaret, uh, it was 1858. Uh, yes, 1858, when Margaret died of ty uh, typhoid fever in, in, in Louisiana, Robert survived, right? Robert survived and uh, he uh, enlisted in the Union Army and he fought on the side, you know, fought on the side of the Union, and then he eventually made his way back up to Ohio. And we don't know what happened to Robert after that. The two children that survived, uh, the two boys, apparently uh, stayed in Louisiana. And some say they, they moved to Mississippi. Some say they stayed in Louisiana. But that's the end of the trail for 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 the rest of the family. But anyway, so, so Morrison takes this story of Margaret Garner and she really sort of reshapes it, reweaves it, retells it to, to bring in all of these other kinds of met, uh, uh, ethical and moral questions uh, that she wants us to engage with uh, in the story. Uh, this is just an image of, uh, if you've seen the movie, I don't know if many of you, some of you might've seen the movie. There's a movie that was directed by uh, Jonathan Demme and um, I've seen the movie a couple of times. It's not a great movie. <laughs> there are some great scenes in the movie. And I like the way they present Beloved when she comes out of the water and she's this full grown 18 year old woman. And there's a scene where she is, you know, she is very unsteady and it's just like she's sleeping on this rock, uh, this big rock uh, next to the road as Setha and Paul D and Denver are coming back from the carnival in that novel, in the novel. And we see that uh, in the movie, she's covered with butterflies and beetles. And uh, Thandi Newton is a British actress who played uh, a beloved in the movie. And how she had the, the uh, I, I don't know, the, the, the strength to have all of the, be covered with all of these insects <laughs> all over. I don't know how she did it. That just creeped me out. But at any rate, it's a, it's a good movie, but I would say Morrison is one of those authors that is very, very difficult to translate 
from uh, from uh, you know the novel to 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 a film. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of the, her other novels have not been translated uh, or uh, <clears throat> you know turned into films because they're, it's really difficult to do. And this is a this is an image of Stamp Paid, uh, played by Albert Hall. Paul D was played by Danny Glover, and Anthony Chisholm played uh, Langhorn, who is not a character in the novel, but who is a character uh, in the in the film. Now, this is the third section of the novel, um, and uh, again, it talks about the house. One twenty-four was quiet. Denver, who thought she knew all about silence, was surprised to learn hunger could do that could do that, quiet you down and wear you out. So it was she who had to step off the edge of the world and die because if she didn't, they all would. At this part, in this part of the novel, uh, the second section, we see that beloved at the beginning, um, uh, Setha and Denver, have, they have accepted her as their long dead or lost sister that has come back into their lives and they're all happy. But then beloved becomes, be, begins to become more and more sinister and becomes more and more abusive, particularly towards Setha, as if punishing her for killing her as a child, right, when she was a child. And she exact, and she's sort of exacting revenge on Setha for having done this act, uh, this heinous act of murdering her. And so in this third part of the novel, it is Denver who has to make the decision of what she's going to do, because her mother is really, really being, you know, run roughshod by uh, by um, Beloved because of her guilt for what she did. And, and, and Beloved is taking full advantage of that guilt. She is wearing Setha out to the point that Setha becomes ill. And so at this point in the novel, Denver has decided, okay, I have to do something. Now, if you recall in the novel, because of what Setha did, you know, by killing her child way, way back early on in the novel, 18 years earlier, the Black community has shunned her. She went a step beyond. She jumped the shark, as we would say today, by murdering her child. They don't want any, to have anything to do with her. So she's isolated at 124 Bluestone Road. Nobody comes to see her. Nobody wants to interact with her because of what she did. But, uh, but the other thing we have to remember is that Setha also isolates herself from the community because of her pride. She says, you don't understand why I did what I did. Any good mother would have done what I did. And so you have this impasse between the community and between Setha. But at this point in the novel, Denver, who has not had any interaction with any of the children in the community, in the black community, any of the adults, she has to decide that, hey, my mother is really getting beaten up by this person, whoever she might be, and I have to do something about it. So Denver, who has not had any contact with the rest of the black community, has to leave that house in order to get help, and she does. And so when I think about all of the characters, to me, it is Denver who is the hero of this novel. Not Paul D., not Setha, not any of it, not Stamp Paid. It is Denver who is the hero. Because Denver, as a young girl, she makes that decision to find help and to get help for her mother. Because as the, as the quotation says, she knows that if she doesn't step off the edge of the world, which is the porch, the house, right? Uh, the porch of the house. If she doesn't go into that community, and who knows what's gonna to happen to her, that if she didn't do something, they all were going to perish. So she goes out into community and she basically saves the day. She brings those, she gets those women to come and to exercise Beloved out of that house, right? They destroy Beloved or do they, right? The, the ending is even as ambiguous as the beginning. At the end of the novel, is Beloved still around? It was Beloved even real? You know, what happened? Some people say, yeah, I saw her. Other people say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And Morrison leaves it up to the reader to decide whether or not Beloved was actually real or not. But the last, uh, the last quotation, uh, one of the last quotations in the novel is very important to understanding um, what's going on. So the, uh, the quotation is, it was not a story to pass on. And this is on Beloved, page 274. And the quotation is down by the stream in back of 124. And this is after Beloved has been exercised, you know, gotten rid of 
um, by uh, the women in the in the community, the black women in the community. Down by the stream and back of 124, her footprints come and go, come and go. Is and that's a really interesting um, quotation because is she there? Is she alive? People think they still see her in the woods, out in the woods, uh, you know, and they and they're not sure if that's really her, if they're hallucinating again. Some people say yes, that's her. Uh, she must have escaped or something. They don't know. But the, the quotation here, it was not a story to pass on, is very important because what Morrison is, is, is asking us about this story, the story about trauma, the story about uh, dehumanization, the story about horror, is it a story that should be told? Is this horrific story about slavery or stories about slavery in general? Should these stories be told? Should these stories, and what's the price of telling these stories or continuing to tell these stories? Is that a way of of exercising the trauma, of healing. Uh, Freud would say, you know, the talking cure, right? The more you talk about your trauma, uh, usually um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the possibility of your healing increases. Or is this a story to pass on, meaning a story not to talk about anymore, right? Is this a story that we should forget rather than remember? And Morrison is not allowing, she's not giving us an answer either way, right? Because if you have a character like Setha, who does not pass on the story, that is, she remembers the story and she continues to remember the story of her trauma at Sweet Home, the plantation um, in which she was raped and other things happened, terrible things happened at Sweet Home. She gets stuck in the trauma, right? She's stuck in the trauma and she can't move on. And when, the, when Beloved comes back, Beloved does not allow her to move on. And so is it a story to pass on or not? Or can we do both? Can we remember these stories of trauma and, and but also not allow this trauma to bog us down and to, and to, and to traumatize us even further? So these are kind of some of the issues that Morrison is getting at in the very, very complex and complicated novel. There have been, I don't know, thousands, thousands of articles, dissertations, books uh, written about Toni Morrison, but particularly this novel, Beloved, because it resonates with so much. And not only resonates with readers in America, but Mor all, Morrison's work has been, all of her novels have been translated, I think about 125 languages. So at uh, various conferences, you will have scholars from China, Japan, Australia, uh, South America, Russia, Canada, Central America, of course, America, and all over the world, Morrison scholars come to talk about Morrison's work. And, you know, when, when people ask me, you know, who do you think is the greatest writer of all time? I automatically say Shakespeare, because that's what I believe. Now, other people might have another idea, but I think it's Shakespeare. And one of the reasons I think it's Shakespeare is because what Shakespeare does is that, you know, even though Shakespeare's work is taking place at a particular time in British history, it is universal because Shakespeare, like the great writers, like Toni Morrison, they're talking about these human, the human condition. They're talking about human emotions. They're talking about jealousy, love, friendship. They're talking about uh, brotherhood. They're talking uh, uh, about, um, they're talking about psychological trauma. They're talking about revenge. All of these things that, you know, that go into making us human, these human emotions. So that's why you can have, you know, Morrison's work translated into 125 languages and all of these scholars from all around the world writing articles and essays and reading her work the same way we have with Shakespeare, whose, whose work has been translated into probably even twice, if not three times as many languages as most modern writers. But because they talk about these very human things, these very human things. And Morrison is a huge, huge fan of Shakespeare. And you can see the influence of Shakespeare in her writing. So uh, she, you know, she is in good company uh, with, with Shakespeare. So um, I, I want to leave, uh, I want to leave you with, with this. Um, if you've only read Beloved or you've not read Beloved, um, please, please, uh, 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 you know, make an attempt to read it. I, I think once you get past the, the experimental nature of this novel, then it becomes easier and easier for you to read. Um, but the other thing I want to say is try some of her other books that are probably not as experimental. You know, for the last, I guess the last three, well, I guess the last two or three novels that she wrote, and Morrison is in her 80s. 
she decided that she says, hey, in, in, with, in my middle period of my, my career, when I wrote Beloved, when I wrote uh, Paradise and Jazz, she says, I was trying to stretch the novel and the innovation and the experimentation that I want to do with the novel. She says, I'm old and I don't have time <laughs> to be as obscure, you know, and to be as, uh, to be as ambiguous about what I want to say because I don't have much time left. And so her later novels, Home, which is a brilliant, wonderful novel, and God Help the Child are two very, very accessible novels that if you are not a fan of this experimental kinds of, of fiction, then try those two, the two, last, the two later novels that, uh, that Morrison wrote, but also try her first novel, which is called The Bluest Eye. And it is kind of experimental, but it certainly is uh, much more accessible than probably that middle period of her work. So I wanna stop right there because I wanna make sure that I have time to answer questions. So I wanted to leave you with these two images of Morrison, two of my favorite images of her. This is in 1974 when she's in New York and that she's you know, uh, just sort of at the, at the beginning of her career as an editor at Random House. And then this is of course Morrison later on in her life when she is now Toni Morrison, Nobel Prize winner for literature. So thank you all so much uh, for coming again. And I'd be happy to take any questions about Toni Morrison, about the novel or anything else. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell, for that great talk. And yeah, I really, we have some comments in the chat and some right. questions, but um, let's ask people um, to um, go ahead and uh, uh, raise your, you see the reaction button to raise your hand if you'd like, and I can call on people. Or um, we have a question right here from Melissa. Why don't we start with that? Um, yeah. Melissa asks on page 132, uh, we see that Morrison added a scene where Paul D was chained up and Native Americans then released them. What do you think of this uh, Black Native American Alliance and why did she add this scene? Oh, that's very, that's very, very good. Now, Morrison, Morrison uh, likes to say, well, you know, <laughs> in terms of history, especially black history. She says, you know, I'm gonna tell the whole story. I'm not gonna tell you a little piece of the story. So uh, you see in a number of Morrison's works, especially a, no a novel like A Mercy, that Morrison does have Native American characters. What she's trying to say here is that blacks and Native Americans had a very interesting relationship at this time. Um, most people don't know this, but there were some Native American tribes that owned slaves. Mm. Right. And, that, and, and also there were some uh, Native Americans who were enslaved. Uh, most people don't know that. But what she's showing here is the cooperation between Native Americans and African Americans, although, because they're both in the same boat in terms of their being <clears throat> um, marginalized and subjugated. Uh, uh, by uh, white America at the time. So we see the sort of cooperation between these two. But the Native Americans know what it feels like. Uh, to be subjugated, to have their land taken, to not be at home, to not feel like they have a, a, a home. And we also see this in, uh, like I mentioned, the, the novel A Mercy, in which the main character comes upon uh, some Native Americans in the woods. And rather giving you the stereotypes about Native Americans that you see like with the John Wayne movies and everything, Morrison complicates, complicates our ideas and undermines our sort of stereotypical ideas about who Native Americans are and what their culture is about. So in A Mercy, when the main character comes, uh, she's a young girl who is traveling through the woods on an errand, um, that a very dire errand that she has to find, she had to find this man, but she comes upon these Native Americans come upon her and, and immediately like in your head, you think, oh, they're gonna assault her. They're gonna rape her, they're gonna, but they don't. They give her water and food and leave her alone and let her go on her way. Morrison is very much interested in telling the whole story, not, not, not wallowing in these stereotypes that a lot of times some, some writers are, uh, or want, want to do. Thanks for the question, Melissa. Great, that's fantastic. Um, so next question actually we've got from a couple of people, both uh, Jill asked, uh, could you say more about the controversy in Ohio? And Melissa had actually earlier asked about the controversy as well, and also what it felt like just to visit a plantation, because that must be just an uncomfortable experience for a lot of us. Yeah, uh, we went to the, uh, so the Toni Morrison Society uh, during the the premiere, the, uh, the Ohio, the Cleveland premiere of, uh, of her opera, uh, her libretto, Margaret Garner. Uh, one part of our part of our uh, the, the, the trip was that we were going to take 
this uh, excursion to Maplewood Farm, a uh, Maplewood plantation that's in northern uh, northern Kentucky. And it's you know you get on the bus and you're you're right there probably in about thirty minutes or so. But at any rate, um, the controversy was that um, that Maplewood Farm now is a tourist site. <laughs> After uh, Morrison's novel was published. Um, uh, people wanted to know, okay, where, where's the farm? Where, is it still, is it still intact? Is it, does it still exist? So the, uh, the, the, uh, family, the descendants of the, uh, of the, the Gaines family, they still own the farm and they turn it into a, a, a tourist, uh, attraction. And let's just say, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, brochure that you get, that, that you get, uh, certainly skewed <laughs> the historical facts about Margaret Garner um, towards, uh, you know, the family looking, uh, you know, uh, putting the family in a, in a brighter light than perhaps what they should have been put in. Uh, basically, the, the woman who was descended of, uh, of the Gaines uh, uh, family who owned the plantation, um, she, she was very adamant that her that her, uh, her, the slave owners, Margaret Garner's slave owners, Archibald particularly, was not that bad. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, uh, actually, uh, and that actually Margaret Garner was very happy to be on the plantation and that they treated her very well and all of these other things which, weren't, were, which were not true. And so I think she was up and sort of alarmed that this group of black scholars and you know, people that just love Toni Morrison and love that novel, were coming. And so she actually had a couple of state troopers there waiting for us. I guess she thought we were going to riot or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it was just, it was so awkward and kind of strange and surreal that we got this group of, you know, bookish, nerdy Morrison scholars and fans coming just to check out the, the farm. And then we were greeted by state troopers in, in this controversy. Uh, surrounding uh, sort of the uh, the sort of the retelling on the, the on the uh, the descendants part about Margaret Garner and and her time on the plantation, that was the controversy. It was all in the newspapers also at the time. Yeah, I I'd like to think that that was shocking, but it's not shocking. I mean, no. I think we've read a lot just in the last year about how plantations <laughs> get repurposed for weddings. And yes, right. Exactly. Like it's really. Um, disrespectful and terrible. Yeah. Um, but uh, another question here, sort of going in a different direction. Uh, Lori, your colleague, wants to know if you actually ever met Toni Morrison or were at an event where she was present. Oh, I've met Toni Morrison on a number of occasions, um, especially through the Toni Morrison Society. Uh, I was at her 80th birthday party in New York, which was a blast. Um, she had all of her friends from Princeton and Howard University and from the University of Texas. And, you know, she had all of her friends, her family was there. Um, she had uh, politicians were there and scholars were there and, and just regular people uh, who, who wanted to meet her. She was extremely gracious, extremely gracious. Um, and so, yes, I've met her on a number of occasions. Now I will say when I was in graduate school at UNC Chapel Hill, she came to Duke one year, and uh, this was in the this was in the early '90s, and by then she was Toni Morrison, and so I remember seeing her car pull up to the entrance of Duke University. It was a big black stretch limo, <laughs> and Ms. Morrison had her entourage there. There were a lot of people surrounding her. I think as she got older, she just pared down, you know, it was, I don't know. She just pared down the, the number of people that she would allow to be around her. It was just her, her, her oldest son and people that she was really, really close to. But during that, you know, that, that, that middle period of her career in the, in the early 1990s, uh, you know, it was Ms. Morrison and she knew she was Ms. <laughs> Ms. Toni Morrison. So yeah, I've met her on a number of occasions. That's amazing. And it's fantastic that you actually got to meet her. Uh, Laura mentioned in the comments that uh, she never got to meet Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, it, it's good. To, it's just incredible to think that we've been living in the same lifetime as such an amazing writer. Yeah. 
Um, back to a sort of more literary question about like the novel itself. Jill wants to know uh, when you you're, you teach your students and they ask about the story not to be told angle, mm -hmm. um, what do they ask and how do they react to it? And what do you say in response to that? Well, we talk about, I sort of set up that the end of the, the novel by talking more about trauma. And we talk about trauma in memory. And we talk about, um, you know, uh, I, I actually pose the question to them and I usually do, I, I used to do that through discussion board. I haven't taught this novel in many, many years uh, because I'm teaching, I usually teach her, her later work. But at any rate, I usually set it up on the discussion board and I have students, I would have students say, so is this a story to pass on or not? And then they would debate back and forth whether or not this was a story to pass on. And uh, many of them would, would say, no, it's just too traumatic. It's just, it's just too horrible a story to pass on. And then they, and then they start talking, usually they'll start talking about what, well, if you don't tell these stories then they're, they're often forgotten, they're lost through history. So isn't it important to tell these stories? And other people will say, yeah, it's important to tell these stories uh, because of that fact, because we lose history. And you know, when I teach Morrison, particularly in my ethnic American literature classes, I said, you know, a lot of these stories we don't get in your, uh, you know, your, your everyday average orthodox history books. We don't get these stories. So when I teach my ethnic American literature classes, I tell students, I say, look, for ethnic American writers, one of the ways that the, one of the ways that they get their history across, whatever their ethnicity might be, is through fiction. Is through the fiction. That's where you're going to get the history, right? That's where you're going to get these stories that are not taught to you you know, in, in most history classes. And that's very important for them to understand. I think this is a story to pass on. But again, it's, it's a story that you, that, uh, that, uh, you should not allow this, 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 this trauma of history to, to uh, bog you down and to prevent you from moving forward, which is exactly what happens to Seth in the novel until Paul D comes along to tell her that she is her best thing, not her children, she is her best thing. So I think that's very important. Great. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic response. And it's important in the, since there is so much controversy now about how race and history in America gets taught to remind ourselves over and over again. And as a librarian, of course, we want people to have access to and make the responsible choices to learn about the difficult parts of our history. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, Melissa, uh, Melissa Pinnell, we've got a couple of questions, one from Melissa Pinnell, one from Melissa Hussein. I'm gonna try and get to both of them. Um, Melissa Hussein wanted to know, uh, again, specifically, uh, she um, was interested in a part two in a poem on page 256. Uh, Morrison says, um, has the character say, um, I drank your blood, I brought your milk. And I, I haven't read the book recently, so I don't have at the top of my head the context of that quote. But do you, do you remember it? And do you have thoughts about what that particular segment means? Sure, that's what, that's the, the scene where, um, when, when Setha murders uh, Beloved as a baby, she cuts her throat. And uh, what she does is, is the baby is suckling her milk. So the baby takes in the milk and the blood at the same time. And so that's what's happening in, in that scene. And it's also, Morrison showed the scene, this, you know, milk is life-giving. Right. And, and but this bloody scene of, of this baby being murdered. Right. And um, and so we have we 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 when um, when uh, beloved is murdered, she has Denver suckling her breast. So even as she murders uh, beloved, the blood is streaming down, uh, you know, her chest. And so Denver is taking in the blood as well as the milk. And uh, and that that is that creates you know even this to the strong bond, you know this traumatic bond between these two characters. Uh, you you notice uh, when Denver is so lonely that she wants she 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 wants beloved with all her might to be her sister to have come back from the dead, but then when she's by the by the third part of the novel when she sees that you know this this woman whoever she is, is up to no good. She knows that she has to do something to to help excise this this woman from their lives, and that's what she does. Yeah, well, the juxtaposition of like nourishing and violence there is mm -hmm. really it's very very impactful. Um, yeah, getting more to the historical context here from Melissa Penel's question, 
Uh, she's curious about whether there are connections between um, the, this novel in particular and maybe all of Morrison's work in Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the, about the attempts to escape slavery by getting to Ohio, the yeah. impact of the fugitive slave law on Stowe's novel, and the story of Margaret Garner in particular. Okay, that's a great question, Melissa. Um, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, is a touchstone in African-American literature. There have been so many Black writers who have responded to Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. It is so, so impactful. Uh, James Baldwin has, Morrison has done it, Ralph Ellison has done it, many, many other writers have responded uh, one way or another to uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And yes, Morrison has read Uncle Tom's Cabin and she is certainly signifying upon Uncle Tom's Cabin in, uh, in Beloved. I, I think one of, the, one of the differences between Morrison's take on you know, slavery, of course, is that um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is, a, is romanticized. Now it is an abolitionist novel, it's an anti-slavery novel, but at the same time it is problematic because it does romanticize slavery certainly to a, to, to a much, much greater extent. Morrison doesn't, Morrison doesn't romanticize slavery, right? Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe does, um, despite what it is trying to do in terms of uh, its uh, abolitionist stance, uh, it certainly is a product of its time, right? In the way that it presents Black people and the way that it presents slavery in the sort of romanticized version, um, this romanticized um, uh, imagination. But with Morrison, Morrison shows us the horror of slavery. Um, she, you know, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, to a much lesser extent, right? She, well, of course, it, it, it's part of, uh, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe being a, a romantic writer of the 19th century and all the constraints that 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 has upon her as a writer that perhaps she, could, she cannot write her novel could not write her novel in a way that would be uh, certainly much more strident and forthright about slavery than what than what she was able to do. But Morrison is definitely, as we would say, speaking back in Beloved to Uncle Tom's Cabin. That's a really good uh, a really good juxtap juxtaposition that I hadn't thought about in a very long time about this about the, the relationship between Beloved and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, uh, again, I, you know, I, I really, really enjoy reading Uncle Tom's Cabin. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the great, great novels of the 19th century. Um, it's one of the great novels in American literature. And I think Morrison recognizes that. But just like any great writer, uh, great uh, work of literature, writers want to put their own spin and, and to talk back to other works of literature in perhaps a different way. And Morrison does that with uh, her novel, Beloved. I think that's really, really interesting and actually leads us well into the next question. Um, Morrison as an editor at Random House, and I think it was really important that you started off by talking about that. I mean, she had the power to introduce new voices and new points of view into work before she even started writing for herself. And mm -hmm. you mentioned Faulkner was a particular favorite of her. Yeah. And what do you think she felt about Faulkner then and how she might have felt about it later in her life? And how do we perceive Faulkner now as somebody who had obviously a very different uh, sensibility towards race, though he also had, had this sort of gothic horror sense mm -hmm. that might have influenced Morrison here? Yeah, I absolutely believe that uh, you know it's true that that Faulkner uh, Faulkner's Gothic sensibility, the Southern Gothic sensibility, as well as you know writers like Edgar Allan Poe and and, and, and Hawthorne and others, uh, had a huge influence on Morrison and her work. Um, I think that she uh, she feels that um, Faulkner, of course, is a brilliant writer. She understands that she understands how brilliant that, that he is, and I know that she admires his work. Now, of course. When one reads, you know, who, whatever writer that you're reading, you have to see them as being human beings, right? So Faulkner had his blind spots. For example, in the 1960s, he wasn't too keen on the civil rights movement, right? He wasn't too keen. And, and to think of, you know, Faulkner at that time in the 1960s being, you know, one of the more progressive Southerners at the time. Right, one of the more progressive Southerners at the time, but then he comes out and says, you know, uh, African Americans need to give the South, you know, more time to get used to, right, to get used to blacks having equal rights. And of course, blacks in the 1960s, including Morrison, is like, you know, that's never going to happen. <laughs> if you give the South more time, it's just going to be more time wasted. 
Um, so on the one hand, I, I would say that Morrison absolutely admires Faulkner and his brilliance, his genius. But at the, on, the, on the other hand, I, I feel that through her work, she also takes him to task for his shortcomings, particularly involving race and gender. I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, it, again, it, it shows how much the publishing industry has changed and how much perspectives have changed that we question uh, Faulkner, who would have been like a pillar of the canon, as it were, now sort of wondering sort of what his place in it is. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I wanted to say a, a little bit more about that. So, you know, like, you know, I, I, I love uh, Hemingway. Uh, he's one of my all-time favorite writers, as well as Faulkner and, and Virginia Woolf. But I love Hemingway, but I also know about Hemingway being very highly anti-Semitic, right? So, uh, you know, I tell students, I said, you know, if we, if we based our reading habits on the private lives of, of the writers that we like, we would not read anything because they all are problematic in some way or another, right? We wouldn't read anything. So I can look at uh, Hemingway and, and know that he is, you know, he is racist. He's racist, right? There's some racist, a lot of racist stuff in his work, anti-Semitic stuff. I can look at uh, uh, Richard Wright, the African-American writer Richard Wright and see the misogyny in his work. Nonetheless, I enjoy them, I read them, but I also point out to students their shortcomings. And that I think that's part of my job as a teacher, um, uh, as an academic, to say, yes, you can enjoy these works. And there is much to offer by these, by these writers who are problematic, but at the same time, you know, you have to understand that they are problematic. Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple more questions that are sort of lead back to Morrison and her perspective. Uh, Melissa Hussein wanted to know what your thoughts were on Morrison's essay, Playing in the Dark, which I'm not familiar with, but maybe it touches mm -hmm. on this. Oh, yes, that's a great, not, that's a great uh, collection of essays because what, what Morrison does in Playing in the Dark is that she, uh, she has this theory of the African, African presence, particularly in 19th and early 20th century American uh, literature. And so basically her theory is, or her idea is that if it were not for the presence of Blacks in these 19th century novelists' work, there would be no American literature. And there would be no American literature. So you have in Hawthorne, you have in Poe, you have in Dickinson, you have in Melville, uh, you have, she talks about Hemingway. She also writes about uh, Willa Cather's novel, Sophia and the Slave Girl. She says that in order for these American writers to, to, um, to structure themselves, that's not the right word, to, to, to make themselves, to, uh, to view themselves as American writers, that the black presence has to be there, that the black presence has to be there in order for them to sort of say, uh, you know, we are Americans, we are American writers, and these are the others, <laughs> right? So it takes the presence of the other in order for these, in for order for these American writers to be who they are. We see it all throughout Edgar Allan Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe if they're talking about shadows or darkness or what's the uh, What's the novel by Edgar Allan Poe in which the, the, the protagonist goes to Antarctica? Um, I think that might, is that, I was thinking of Lovecraft actually, which a similar yeah. thing. But, I can't uh, remember the, the uh, I can't remember the name of the novel, but blackness and, 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 and black people are all throughout that novel. Oh, you look at Melville's Moby Dick and you have Pip, right? Pip who, 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 who jumps overboard or is thrown overboard into the ocean. Like black people are everywhere in these 19th century novels, whether they're in the background or in the foreground, they're everywhere. And Morrison sees this as a sign of how American literature was shaped because of the presence of the Afri what she called the Africanist presence in, in, uh, in American literature. And I think it's, I think it's true to a, to a large extent. I looked it up and a bunch of other people jumped into the chat to supply. That's the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. That's right. It's one of the strangest novels you're ever going to read, but it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's so brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and and, and Poe likes to, you know, Poe was involved in the slave trade for a little while. You know, again, you have a lot of writers, writers are problematic, but but my goodness, you cannot, you cannot deny their brilliance. You, I, at least I can't. You know, and, and I have, you know, sometimes when you get a student, I don't want to read this writer for, you know, fill in the blank because of fill in the blank. 
I'm like, well, you're shortchanging yourself, and that and, and and that's not critical thinking. You're being lazy, <laughs> right? You're being lazy. I just talked to a friend of mine. Actually, this is a little bit of a tangent. Some of you know um, the uh, photography of uh, what's her name? Mayor is her last name, and I and I can never remember her first name. Um, but she's a photographer that's just been sort of rediscovered. Uh, is a photographer of New York and a Jewish photographer in New York and and, and uh, Chicago took thousands of pictures, right? Thousands of photographs. And so a friend of mine was talking about, she had this graduate student who was taking, um, there's an exhibit in Chicago right now, and she was taking, and the, the graduate student Hispanic, she was taking these students to this exhibit. And the graduate student was saying something like, you know, who, why should, why should I take my students, these students to see these, you know, the, this, the work by this, you know, old white woman and blah, blah, blah. And, I, and I'm like, that is just some of the laziest thinking and the most backwards thinking and this is a graduate student thinking this i'm like that's that's no reason that's not a legitimate reason not to take students to see these photographs you know it'd be a di you know if she would have come at this ex exhibition from a from a different critical stance like actually going to see the exhibition and saying okay you know um this 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 photographer took lots of pictures of hispanic people and african americans and women and all kinds of scenes all throughout her career, what is it like for a Jewish woman to be behind the lens taking these kinds of photographs? To me, that's a much more interesting question than just dismissing somebody because of their race, because of their gender, because of whatever. It's just dumb. It's just, well, that's just my opinion. You might disagree, but to me, it's dumb. Oh, no. I mean, as librarians, we, of course, stock pretty much everything in our collections. Mm -hmm. And we have to tell people you need to consider how this was written, why this was written, what the author's perspective. Yeah. So, that's right uh, we definitely professionally agree <laughs> uh, <laughs> i think the photographer might, i just googled quickly might have been uh sonia hendelman meyer and i i tossed a link there in the chat it might be her yeah might um, be her. so I, I think we need to wrap up soon but we've got a couple more questions that maybe we can get to real quickly uh, okay we have jess here from the library uh wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, God Save the Child, because it's one mm -hmm. of her favorites. Yeah. And how do you think about it in terms of genre, whether it's more of a, a gothic horror or more like a thriller? And uh, Melissa Hussein wanted to ask again, uh, what uh, her favorite book is, um, A Mercy. And they wanted to know what your favorite Toni Morrison book was, in addition okay. to the genre question. <laughs> All right, so in terms of uh, God Save the Child in uh, as a genre, you know, what genre does it fit in? You know, as, as I mentioned, Morrison by the end of, toward the end of her life, when she's writing these last couple of novels, she's like, I don't have time to be so, you know, so cute and clever, <laughs> you know, and so experimental. I'm gonna write a straightforward, I'm gonna write a novel as straightforward as possible. Now, the, the novels in terms of getting into them and reading them, right, it's much, much easier to get into those novels than it is to get into Paradise or uh, Beloved or Jazz or Love or any of those more experimental novels. I see it as a realistic novel, but there is some sort of magic real, there is some elements of magic realism in that. Because if you remember in, in that, uh, in the novel, the protagonist, the protagonist thinks that she's, that she's de-aging, right? That she is becoming younger and younger and is based on trauma that she suffered when she was a young girl. Now, is she actually, you know, uh, 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 regressing in age or is she, or is this all in her head and because of the trauma that she suffered when she was a young girl? So I see, you know, uh, I see <clears throat> connections between Morris, that novel and a lot of Morrison's earlier novel, especially The Bluest Eye, because if you re recall in God, uh, God Help the Child, that uh, the protagonist is a, uh, is a, 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 you know, is very dark skinned. And in The Bluest Eye, we have Picola Breedlove, who's also very dark skinned and she's ridiculed for it. I think those two novels are companion pieces if you ask me, because it, it, if you look at the, the character and the protagonist in God, uh, Help the child. I would say that that if if Picola Breedlove had actually grown up right to be an adult, that would be the the protagonist in in that uh, uh, in that novel, and that would be the protagonist in God Help the Child. Still, tra still trauma going on, but you notice in, in God Help the Child, 
that the that the uh, protagonist is able to work through that trauma. And there is and that's one of the few novels in, uh, in Morrison's uh, uh, um, body of work in which there is a possibility, a real possibility of a happy ending for the for the characters. Uh, so that's how I see that. Now, what's my favorite novel of, of uh, Morrison novels? That's Sula, I think. <laughs> I was just gonna say, that's really hard to say, but I think it would be Sula. Um, and, uh, and right behind that, probably on the same level would be Beloved and a Mercy. Uh, just brilliant stuff, just absolutely brilliant novels. But Sula, I like Sula because she's real, she's this very, uh, very much an anti-hero and she pretty much does what she wants to do. And, uh, you know, uh, the world would not be a good place if everyone just did what they wanted to do with no consequences or, you know, or just uh, not thinking of, of how one's action will, would affect anybody else, which is what Sula does. Um, but, you know, if, if that were the case, at least for a little while, that might be an interesting way to live one's life. <laughs> so that's my favorite novel, is Sula. All right, that's fantastic. Uh, well, I hope that everybody who joined us this evening also has a favorite Coney Morrison novel or has been mm -hmm. inspired to go out and read one that they hadn't been as familiar with before. Um, it's of course up to you, but we are at 830 now. So yeah. I think we just want to thank you again for coming. Um, really appreciate everything that you said tonight and your willingness to take so many questions. I hope that I got to everybody's questions and uh, feel free to um, follow up if you would like, uh, but uh, otherwise thank you and it was a great evening. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you everybody for coming. I had a blast. Nice to see all of my colleagues and friends and friends of uh, the Chelmsford Public Library, you guys put on some wonderful, wonderful programs. So thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you all.